for ministry, for service, and for relationships. If we can focus on the relational dimension of spheres for a few moments this morning as we bring this series to a conclusion, I want to highlight some important aspects of what we've said. We said in the series that God has given to each of us different circles of influences, different spheres that we're to, to operate in uh, relationally. We talked about how that our relationship with God is a sphere, our relationship with our spouses and our children, our relationship with other believers in a local church community, uh, unbelievers in the marketplace, co-workers vocationally. These are all spheres, and that's what the different circles represent in our logo and our theme for the year. What we're talking about is a measure, a portion, an allotment of territory given to us by God in terms of how we relate to other people in life's journey. There are people that God has called you to relate to, to influence, to build relationships with, to do life with, that I can't connect with. And there are people he's given me to connect with. Why? Because we all have different circles, different allotments of territory, different measures that God has given to us. We said in the series that there's two things we absolutely cannot do by ourselves. Number one is marriage, and number two, Christianity. This morning I've titled my message, No Man Stands Alone. I know some of you are thinking there has to be an exception to that rule. Well, I can only think of one. The story begins in heaven. After the final judgment, God appeared and said, I want the men to stand in two lines. One line for the men who were true heads of their households, and the other line is for those of you men who were dominated by your wives or by the women in your lives. He said, I want all the women to report to St. Peter. Soon the women were gone and there were two lines of men. This is the only exception I've ever been able to find. The line of the men were dom who were dominated by their wives was 100 miles long. And in the line of men who were true heads of their household, there was only one man. God said to the men who were standing in the long line, those who were dominated by the women in their lives, he said, you should be ashamed of yourselves. I created you to be the head of your households. You've been disobedient and have not fulfilled your purpose. Of all of you, only one obeyed. Learn from him. Behold the man. God turned to the man and says, tell them how you managed to be the only one in this line. He said, Lord, it was real simple. My wife told me to stand here. We have to laugh a little bit, right? A number of years ago, there was an instructional uh, set of videos that was published called Lessons from the Master. The idea was that you can get coaching from the world's leading authorities on any area that you were interested in. For example, you can get golf tips from some of the greatest golfers like Tiger Woods. You can get relational tips from some of the greatest psychologists of the last 20 years, like Dr. Phil, for example. You can get motivational tips from some of the greatest football coaches in recent memory. Uh, gentlemen like Mike Ditko is one that they highlight. I prefer to hear from Coach Sam Rotigliano, but they were highlighting Coach Mike Ditka. And I wonder, whom would we go to if we were to seek out who was the leading expert in history on the importance of community? The importance of building relationships. The importance of, of building and developing spheres groups, since we're talking about spheres. Who would we go to to understand how to master the complexities of human nature, all of the subtle nuances of how people get connected spiritually and how people truly become followers of Christ? Who would we go to if we wanted to understand how it is that transformation happens in a person's life. Who would we go to for coaching on how to create a life-changing, life-shaping, life-giving, life-forming network of relationships? In my opinion this morning, I think there's really only one that we could go to, and his name is Jesus. He was the ultimate master of understanding all the spheres of our lives relationally. And when Jesus was thinking about how to extend his movement and his dream beyond his own physical life on earth, he did one thing. 
He didn't start a country, didn't form an army, didn't create a university, an institution, a corporation, didn't endow a foundation. He started a spheres group. Gathered together a handful of individuals around him. Used a real life-changing curriculum to launch that group. In Mark chapter 3, verse 13, the scripture says, Jesus went up into the hills and invited those he wanted with him. And they came to him. He settled on 12 and designated them as apostles. The plan would be that they would be with him. We refer to it as the be with him plan so that he might send them out. Now, of all things that Jesus could have done, why would he have chosen that method and that model? He understood their, the, that where their lives uh, were currently in the moment, what needed to change in their lives. He understood from the very beginning that the Jesus movement, in order for it to be launched, had to be done very strategically. And of all things, Jesus chose a small group a spheres group to become the catalyst to change people's lives, to change the world as we know it. The curriculum would be generated and motivated by the Be With Him plan or the Be With Him curriculum. Together they would learn together, study together, they would pray together, argue together, forgive together. And Jesus would just simply be with them for a three and a half year period of time and that plan would generate momentum, generate energy, life change, transformation in such a way that would ultimately transform, transform the world as we know it today. When they tried to serve God, Jesus would always be with them. When they would fail, Jesus would be with them. When they were sick, he would be there. When they were discouraged, when they were confused, he would commit to being with them. That was the plan from the beginning. They would walk through life together, and that was the plan that Jesus set in motion. He was teaching them from the beginning how to be not only with him, but how to be together, how to connect with each other. He wanted them to understand the profound importance of being connected, doing life with Jesus, and doing life with each other under the guidance of the Holy Spirit following a master plan that would become transformational for them because he understood the profound importance of being connected vertically and being connected horizontally. The plan would teach them how to go upward and how to go inward so ultimately they could learn how to go outward. And you know we've talked about in our series, that's our vision as a church is learning to connect upwardly, inwardly, and outwardly. Those three words capture our vision in a nutshell. It's so all you have to remember is upward, inward, and outward. Everything we do here in our community is about the upward, the inward, and the outward. If you go through the book of Acts, which is the historical book of the New Testament, gives us the historical record of the early church. It talks about all these little communities that began to emerge and to grow in the church. Clusters of believers who met in homes and acts. It talks about the house of a man named Jason, the house of a man named uh, Titus and Justice, Philip, Lydia's house, the house of the Philip, uh, Philippian uh, jailer, the house of Mary, the mother of John. Uh, these were places where people met in the New Testament in spheres where they were gathering together in circles of influence in order to, to connect upward, inward, and ultimately to connect outwardly. In the New Testament, the idea was not that you had sphere groups that you could be a part of as an, options, as an option. The, the sphere groups was the church. That was the primary place that they met for the first 300 years. In the city of Jerusalem, in the church of Jerusalem, the scripture tells us in Acts chapter 2 that they would meet occasionally in the temple courts for a public celebration like we are experiencing today. But of all the other places where Christianity spread, they didn't have that kind of a gathering place until later on. It wasn't until after 300 years into the church's history that the church was able to start building centralized places of worship. It was driven by spheres groups. 
It was driven by the groups that spun off of the original group that Jesus started with the 12 disciples. And it speaks to us of the need for us to be connected, not only with the big, but to be connected with the small, to be connected with three to 12 other individuals in a group where we are learning to do life together, uh, to follow the be with him plan and to take some lessons from the master. And so this morning, I want to just take a few moments. If you're a follower of Christ and you're not a part of a spheres group, you absolutely need to be a part of a spheres group in order to really become complete in him, in order to go the distance. I'm going to show you scripturally some of the lessons that, that the master has taught us about why these groups are so crucial for us. We have a whole... Um, array of those groups meeting in our church now we're going to be launching a whole new wave of those groups in the month of March uh, the first Sunday in March March 2nd we have a leadership training dinner here uh, in the hospitality room on a Sunday night March 2nd at 530 and anybody who is interested in in getting connected to a spheres group to open their home perhaps teach or lead or facilitate or you've got some creative ideas of how you'd like to see some different groups flourish in the church that's going to be happening the first Sunday in March, and we want to invite you to come and join us because we have a whole new wave of groups that we're starting in March because we believe it's part of the lifeline for what keeps us connected, helps us grow spiritually, helps us to push back the, the forces of darkness and the temptations that we all face on a, a daily, weekly basis in our lives. So if we come to Jesus and we kind of just put him into uh, the curriculum of being one of the masters, to speak to us about our spiritual lives and about going the distance spiritually, there's some real profound lessons that he has to share with us. Lesson number one is that people are committed to connecting together when it comes to growing spiritually and becoming a part of a spheres group. The other chapter I asked you to turn to was Acts chapter 2. This is really fascinating. In Acts chapter 2, after... The Holy Spirit was sent down on the day of Pentecost. People ask, and we'll talk about this in our Holy Spirit seminar, when, you know, when did the church like, actually really start? What was the first day that you can point back to and say, this was the beginning of the church of Jesus Christ as we know it? Anybody know what day that was? Yeah, it was the day of Pentecost. Jesus said, you wait. And they waited in Jerusalem. It was, it was Mary the mother of Jesus and the disciples, there was 120 of them, the remnant, waiting after the ministry of Jesus had come to a conclusion. He ascended into heaven. He said, you go in Jerusalem, you wait because I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. There was a tremendous transformational shift that took place. Jesus, the second person of the Godhead, ascended into heaven, and that's where he is right now, seated at the right hand of the Father. He sends down the Holy Spirit. Something radical takes place on the day of Pentecost. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. They've received the Spirit, but now they're filled and endued with power. We'll talk about the difference between being born of the Spirit and being filled with the Spirit in our seminar. Because they were filled and empowered with the Spirit. And if you remember, Peter, who denied Jesus, was in hiding. He, he was fearful like some of the other disciples, that they, they, were, they were being lined up next to be crucified by the Romans. So Jesus denies Peter, uh, or Peter denies Jesus three times, goes into hiding. They're fearful for their lives. Jesus sends the Holy Spirit upon them. They receive power. Their lives are transformed by the third person of the Godhead touching them. They go out into the marketplace and this impact upon their lives, being filled and baptized with the Spirit, creates such a stir. There was a great feast being held in Jerusalem. It was the Feast of Pentecost. People had come from all over the world into the marketplace to celebrate this feast. And there they are in the marketplace, and a great crowd gathers. And Peter stands up as he's anointed by the Holy Spirit. He's given a new found purpose, a new boldness. He stands up, he preaches from two passages in the Old Testament out of the book of Psalms and the book of Joel. 3,000 of the Jews, many of them who stood in the crowd when the crowd said crucify him, were convicted by the Holy Spirit. Peter preaches, they surrender their lives to Christ, and the scripture says 3,000 of them were saved in that marketplace, and it became 
the launch of the church and Christianity as we know it. Acts chapter 2 begins to describe for us what the church looked like in its very early inception. In Acts chapter 2, we're given four things that they were doing to help the church grow and develop. It says that they were, they were following the apostles' doctrine. That was the teaching portion. The emphasis was on the importance of the teaching of God's word. They were breaking the bread together. They were having communion to remember the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ. They were praying together, just like we gather on Wednesday nights from 5.30 to 6.30, and we have men's prayer on Friday mornings, and we pray before our services. It's a habit and a practice that Christians have of, of calling on God for his help and intervention and his guidance and his direction. How many of you believe in the power of prayer? How many of you know that prayer makes a difference? And then it says that they were fellowshipping with each other. Acts chapter 2, look at this verse, says they devoted themselves to fellowship. The Greek word here is the word koinonia. It was a relational term used by the Greeks that spoke of communion. It spoke of relationship. It spoke of this unique emphasis on people connecting together in community. It's amazing how we are more connected than we've ever been before through social media, and yet loneliness, depression, and disconnectedness is like at an all-time epidemic in our culture. How's that possible? Because there's just something about us being with other people face-to-face, side-by-side, that can never be replaced by the airwaves. We've got billions and billions and billions of Text being sent around the world, and yet we are more disconnected than we've ever been before. Where'd they get this idea from? Fellowshipping, communing, relating to one another, supporting each other, encouraging one another, praying for one another, picking each other up when somebody fell. When somebody was sick, they would pray. Where'd they get that idea of fellowship? They got it from Jesus, because that's what Jesus did. That's what he modeled for them when he first launched that first spheres group. He never made them feel like it was an obligation that they had to be there. See, they came because they wanted to come. They wanted to connect. There's no record of any other rabbi ever in the history of Judaism going out and recruiting people to come and be a part of his group. They didn't do that. The Talmudin, which was the strategy of the rabbis, was that they waited for students to come and seek them out. But that wasn't true of Jesus. Jesus went and he invited and found them and said, come and follow me. It was by invitation. We're making an invitation to you as a community and all of our leaders to come and join a spheres group, a life-changing group. They happen at all times and all places throughout the week. It doesn't have to be in a set night. It can be in a morning, an afternoon, an evening. We're going to talk about some of the different kinds of groups that are available. Not with Jesus. Jesus came along and said, I want you. I want you. No other rabbi did that. It was considered beneath their dignity. Jesus said, can you imagine what it would be like to be a part of a, a group that I'm leading? A person as powerful and as dynamic as Jesus. Can you imagine how the 12 felt? The number one question that Jesus probably was getting after he chose the 12 was, why did you choose them? The least likely that you and I thought would have been chosen, Jesus chose. Why would he have chosen those 12 individuals? Was it because they were really smart, rich, resourceful, powerful, uh, influential? Absolutely not. Peter was impulsive. Thomas was a doubter. Judas was greedy. James and John were ladder climbers. There was a man named Simon who was a zealot, which meant he hated tax collectors. That means he hated Matthew. There was another guy named Matthew who was a tax collector, which meant that he hated zealots. Why in the world would Jesus choose these individuals? Because Jesus saw who they were going to become in the future as they passed through the be with him plan, as they became a part of a spheres group and life change and transformation began to take place in their lives. 
as they experienced community, Jesus knew it would affect them in the core of their being. Jesus knew that their battleground would be the same battleground that you and I have, and that's the battleground of becoming disconnected from the upward and the inward and the outward. 24-7, you and I have an adversary that is fighting to disconnect us from the upward, the inward, and the outward, to disconnect us spiritually. What are some of the obstacles? Well, we have our own fallen nature within us, our selfishness, our pride, our ego, that low self-esteem, those broken places we talked about last week in, in, in family life. Brokenness in families is like one of the number one epidemics that we're facing in our culture today. That's part of our fallenness, our fallen nature. It, it, it has a way of disconnecting us from God, creating frustration and, and anger and bitterness in our lives. The prevailing forces of the culture are working to disconnect us. Jesus said in the parable of the sower, he said, there's three things that come in and choke the word in your life that produces change and transformation and connects you upward, inwardly, and outward. He says, the cares of this world, how many of you got some cares you brought with you this morning? We all have cares. He said, it's the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things that come in and choke the word and distract us and disconnect us. And then how about Satan and the forces of darkness? All working to disconnect us through isolation, loneliness, depression, offenses. The enemy will try to get us to pick up offenses towards God and towards one another. And oh, they become very sticky. That's why Jesus said, woe unto you who pick up an offense. Because if you let that offense get into your heart, it's like glue. An offense, when it attaches itself to the human heart, always leads to betrayal. If you allow it to stay there and you don't deal with it. He said, woe unto you. How about discouragement? That's like the number one tool of the enemy. To try to pry people's heart open and to disconnect them from God. And so God has set in motion a, a series of, of, of counter responses that serve to keep us connected. Say, Michael, if we got all of that working against us, how, how do we stay connected upwardly, inwardly, and outwardly? Well, God said, I've given you all the resources that you need. You've got, number one, the grace of God working in your life, that unmerited favor, that unmerited power, that is working in your life that I give to you freely, that grace which forgives and cleanses and covers you and renews you and accepts you no matter where you are in the journey, just like Jesus accepted all of these individuals that he invited to be a part of the Spheres group. When he first called Peter and said, Peter, I want you to come and follow me. I want you to be a part of my group. You know what Peter said? He said, Lord, depart from me. I am a sinful man. Immediately, he became aware of all of the th reasons why he shouldn't get connected. But Jesus covered Peter with grace, as God covers you and I with grace. The Word of God is a connector. Every time you get into the Word of God and you do personal devotions, you come to church and you, you hear the Word of God preached and proclaimed, you know what it does? It ignites your heart for God. It feeds your soul. It connects you upwardly. And you find strength and encouragement. How about the Holy Spirit? Why do we do Holy Spirit seminars? Because the Holy Spirit, the Scripture says, is our helper. Jesus said, I'm going to send to you a helper. The Greek word is parakletos. Literally translated, one called alongside to help. You have somebody who's been called alongside to help you. He's the third person of the Godhead who is with you, who will be in you, who will come upon you and give you wisdom, counsel, understanding, insight, how to make your family work, how to meet those challenges you're facing financially, how to meet and fight those inner demons that you wrestle with, how to get free from those addictions. Why? Because he's walking with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. If you call in the name of Christ and you are a Christ follower, the Spirit of God is with you. He's a connector. The Sunday celebration services we have. Do you know why you get hammered on Saturdays and Sunday morning to get here? Because the enemy knows that if you come, you're going to get lifted to a higher place. God's going to fill you. He's going to empower you. He's going to break through the barriers. He's going to make you a better person. So the enemy, he resists. He pushes your buttons. Anybody have any buttons pushed this morning? 
Why? Because he's a button pusher. But you know what? God has got a counter response to every button that Satan wants to push in your life. And if you'll just make a choice to say, I'm coming, I don't care how I feel. I don't care what work is not done. I don't care what kind of distractions I'm facing. If you'll stand up, get up, show up, God will move on your behalf. And God will make you a better person, and you'll leave her better than when you came, and it'll set the tone for your week to come. Why? Because what we're talking about is overcoming those disconnectors and getting connected to Him. The small group experience, church, is ultimately the thing that helps us to go from the upward into the outward, and the outward to the or the inward to the outward, is the community of the sphere group experiences. What are we talking about? We're talking about learning from the master, uh, learning and understanding that in a great spheres group that people are committed to connecting to one another. Number two, people are drawn to interest, needs, and opportunity. This is fascinating. If you look at verse 46 of Acts chapter 2, it says, every day they continue to meet together in the temple courts. There's the public celebration they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad circle that word glad hearts they did it because they were having an awesome time doing it they were happy they were joyful they found fulfillment in connecting together it wasn't drudgery when people join a church or a spheres group it's because something in them is drawing them to something in the people in the community. You're here this morning because something in you is connecting with something in me. And something in you is connecting with other people in this community. Why? Because there is such a thing as relational DNA, emotional DNA, spiritual DNA. And that DNA within you is drawing you to connect with me, and me with you, and you with each other in the community of faith. That's what makes every local church so unique and so different. And because of that, we've got different kinds of groups that we call spheres groups. We have spiritual spheres groups that are designed to help people grow and to be discipled spiritually. Bible studies, spiritual focus groups. But we also have what we call social groups. These are groups that are built around interests. We've got shooting groups, fishing groups. we got book clubs. We've got groups that meet for recovery purposes. We've got groups that are meeting for all kinds of interests in these. We have a job seekers group that is starting here in the next couple of weeks. For those of you who are in job transition, why? Because that's an interest, that's a need, that's an opportunity, right? And so when we take the things in our lives that, that we're interested in, that we have an affinity for, and we connect with each other around that, we are accomplishing a spiritual purpose in the kingdom of God. So we have spiritual groups, we've got uh, social groups, we've got outreach groups. We got groups that meet and go out and serve in the community. Our Acts 29 group uh, goes out and it serves in the community and it it ministers to seniors and and, uh, single moms and people who are in need in the community to help to provide service. We're taking Spheres teams to other countries for short-term mission trips. We're taking a team to Haiti. We just had a team come back from Mexico. These are around the interest of going out and doing world missions. That's a, an area of interest, isn't it? It's a Spheres group. We've got all kinds of different groups to connect you at any level, no matter where you are in your journey. Why? Because as we learn from the master, we understand that great spheres groups are committed to connecting people one to another, are drawn by interest, needs, and opportunity, are about real people who are authentic, coming together, number three. Because the scripture says they continue to meet together in the temple courts, they broke bread in their homes, they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. The word sincere is a really interesting word in the original language. 
There's an old story about its origin. It gives a picture of its meaning that's really challenging for us today. The word sincere is made up of two Latin words, the word sin, which means without, and seer, which means wax. The Romans prized ancient Greek statues during the time of Jesus. Here's the story. These century-old statues would have been cracked or chipped. Sometimes sellers would pour wax into the cracked areas to cover up the flaws and make the statue look better than it really was. If you found, uh, if you found one of those and bought one of those covered-up statues, you would be disappointed in the day of Christ. But if the statue was authentic, there was no attempt to hide the flaws, then it would be labeled sincere without wax. Here was a new community where people met together. They ate together around areas that they were interested in and connected to, and they did it with sincere hearts. There was no hiding, no covering up, nothing unusual. Whatever was going on in the group, the people in that small group knew about it. They supported each other. They rejoiced in the victories. They shared in their sorrows and their defeats together and supported and encouraged one another. When somebody was sick, they rallied around and supported each other. And there was this genuineness in this authenticity. Nobody would have been heard saying, I am feeling overwhelmed because I'm dealing with this alone and by myself. Because there was a realness and a genuineness among those in the group. George Barna found that the number one thing that unchurched people are looking for in America today, in a church, and in a spiritual community, is authenticity. They just want to know what's going to happen. How are you guys going to react if, if, if one of those Christ followers in the church community goes through a divorce? Are you going to ostracize them and kick them out, or are you going to embrace them in that pain and that brokenness? What are you doing with the single moms who are trying to make it by themselves. They just want to sit and observe for a while how we relate and interact with one another because they want, they want the real. They want the authentic. They want the genuine. One of the things that attracted me to Linda when we first met was that she's an incredibly genuine, authentic person. She's a person without pretense. I mean, you know, what you see is what you get. I mean, Linda is just that kind of a person, and I found that incredibly attractive and still find that attractive today. Uh, and part of that reason why that I think I was drawn to that quality as I think about it and have thought about it over the years is that there's a part of me that struggles to f be free like that as a person. I can often find myself much more calculating than I would like to be. Linda doesn't think that way, but I do sometimes. I admit that. Some of you guys may think that way. We're a little more calculating in the way we want to present ourselves and the way that we want other people to think about us. So that genuine, authentic, without pretense approach to life becomes a little bit more difficult for some of us. So I find myself some, sometimes working hard to manage what somebody thinks of me or even maybe to tell a story that's a little bit brighter, a little bit more positive in how it portrays me as a person. That's just kind of part of my life and part of my journey. How about you? Do you find it easy just to be real, genuine, and authentic? See, when you come and spend time with Jesus and you become a part of a spheres group, it helps you to open up and to allow yourself to be more real and more genuine. Um, we do that on Friday morning prayer in our men's spheres group. I've been doing it for 17 years now almost. Six o'clock. For one hour, we gather together in my home. We have men that come and have come for 16 years, and we are just there. We support each other. We pray for one another. You know what? We don't have a problem saying, you know what? We've had a tough week, or this has been a challenge, and we encourage. And we, you know, the Gridirons Conference, we had over 290 guys from all over the city. We gathered together. You know what we did? We were real, and we were genuine, and we were authentic with each other. And that's not something that guys do naturally. But the Holy Spirit opened us up in such a way it was so freeing, so liberating. Guys were experiencing miracles and breakthroughs. Why? Because what we're talking about is being a part of a, of a great group. And I want to wrap it up here in the next moment or two, so let's just do this. Number four, people experience transformational change. So if you look at Matthew or Mark chapter 3, verse 13, it says that Jesus called them to himself 
They came to him. Verse 14, the other part of this passage says he appointed 12 that they may be with him. So the calling was is that he not only drew them to himself, not only picked them, but he said, I want you to be with me. Because Jesus knew that if they would just spend time with him for that three and a half year period of time, that there would be transformation, there would be change. And when you spend time with Jesus in a life-giving community, like Word of Grace, and you get into a spheres group, you know what's going to happen? You're going to start changing. You know what? A year or two later, you're going to look more like Jesus than you did when you started. Because what happens in a spheres group, in a community that is spiritually thriving, you know what happens? The principles and the habits and the attitudes of Jesus start getting transferred to you. And the way that you start thinking and acting and reacting is going to become different. It's going to change over time. And lastly, we begin to realize that it's not just about us. It's about us sharing it with others, that a great spheres group realizes they're always committed to a mission beyond. So Jesus said to them, this is what I want you to do. He said, come and follow me so that I can make you fishers of men. See, the call was to come and be with Jesus for a season, and they were to be then released to go out and to become fishers of men, to draw others to come in. It surpassed their wildest dreams and imagination. They never thought they'd go beyond Jerusalem. They ended up going out to Judea and Samaria, to the other most parts of the earth, to places they never dreamt that they would go in order to share this life-giving message. Church, Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. No matter where you go in this city, if you start a small group, some of you have got some real incredible interests. Roy loves to fish. And so Roy started a spheres group for people who have an interest in fishing, and now he's doing a gigantic tournament. This will be a second year in order to draw people in and to reach out because he understands that he has a mission to go out and to invite people to come and be a part of the journey of following Christ. What's the interest? What's the connection? It's that that tournament, it's that fishing, it's that common interest and that common connecting point. Why? Because it's not just about us. It's about us taking it out and sharing it with a lost and a dying. That's part of your crown and your reward for the future. These guys, their lives were so changed that they were willing to lay their lives down and most of them became martyrs for the cause of Christ. That's how transformed their lives were by being with Jesus. What would happen if all of us spent time with him by being a part of the big and being a part of the small? In your bulletin, you have got an invitation to come and join us for this kickoff on March 2nd, but you also have a sign-up card to just say, hey, I want to get involved in a group. I got some ideas. I might be able to open my home. I might be able to just show up and be a part of one once a month. Whatever it is, we want to ask you to fill one of these cards out. Take your pen and put your name down. Say, I want to get connected to a spheres group because I know and I believe that being with Jesus and being with other believers is part of what God is doing in order to bring transformation in my life. How many of you would be willing to make a commitment to say in 2014, I want to get connected to not just only the big but the small? Put your hand up real high. If that's you, I want you to take a step to fill that card out. Uh, you're going to give it to one of the ushers, and our ushers are going to come in just a moment and collect and gather these, or you can bring it back to the Welcome Center and say, I want to be a part of the plan to, to grow spiritually and for this community to grow spiritually. And with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if you're here this morning and your battle in any way, shape, or form is, everybody's head bowed and your eyes closed just for a moment. If it's with isolation or loneliness, I want you to just put your hand up and say, Michael, pray for me. I'm just feeling really, I'm feeling disconnected today. I need to get connected. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Others, maybe you're listening online and you just need a connection. You need God to get you connected today. I, I want to pray for you. It begins by getting connected upward. If you've never gotten connected upward, that's the place we always start. So I want to pray for you. But if you're here this morning and you need to take a step to get connected upwardly by surrendering your heart to Christ and beginning in a special relationship with him. I'm going to pray a response to prayer, and I want to ask you just to pray this prayer with me. If you're listening online, this is the step we take to receive eternal life, to get right with God, and to establish that crucial upward connection that defines our lives. 
pray this with me and as a congregation you can just join me say Lord Jesus I believe you died on the cross for my sin and you rose from the dead on the third day so that I might have life and have it more abundantly Lord I want to be a part of your community a life-giving community I want to be a part of your church I want to be a part of a spheres group just like the group that you started over 2,000 years ago I invite you into my heart to be my Lord and my Savior today Jesus I ask for forgiveness I ask for your help today guide me I pray in Christ's name and father right now for those who are feeling isolated and disconnected I pray that you reach down and you would touch them may they feel the love and the support of somebody in this community and may they feel your love and support touch them right now by the Holy Spirit and we ask you Holy Spirit to come and to teach us and guide us in this seminar this afternoon it's going to be transformational for many we invite you to come as the teacher and the guide light our hearts on fire oh God we pray make our community come alive so that we can understand how important it is to connect upwardly inwardly and then outwardly as we invite others to join us we pray in Christ's name let's congratulate those who did that for the first time let them know that we support them why don't you stand with me this morning and if you took that step for the first time we want to just let you know that the commitment you made this morning is the biggest most important commitment you can ever make the Bible says that when one person connects upwardly that all the angels in heaven are rejoicing so for those of you who took that step this morning heaven's rejoicing and God's saying hey you got to really fight to protect what's happened in your heart you got to get into a local church you got to start reading the word because that's one of the great connectors isn't it we got gift Bibles as you leave you can just take a Bible begin reading in the Gospel of John we're gonna be doing a 40 days in the word in 2014 and we're together gonna to rediscover the power of this book for our lives how many of you believe it's transformational amen fathers we leave today we thank you that those ministering angels are watching over all of us and keeping us in our ways of service and obedience help us to intentionally get connected Lord in these groups and to get connected with you in a way God that will give us strength and staying power we pray in Christ's name amen and amen